Thanks all for introducing yourselves in the chat. Welcome to today's conversation on philanthropy's role in system change for behavioral health. I'm so happy to be here with you for today's conversation and with our panelists. My name is Abby Ridgway and I'm a managing director with FSG. I lead our firm's health practice and I will be joined today by three phenomenal individuals who will be sharing their insights about how philanthropy can advance behavioral health equity. Before we begin, I'll be giving a couple remarks to help um, set the stage and frame today's conversation. First, a couple notes on some technical aspects of today's conversation. We are excited to hear from you throughout this conversation. I will be asking the panelists some questions and then we'll be taking some questions from the audience. So please share any questions you have for the panelists in the Q&A box. That's different than the chat box, but in the Q&A box, you can also see other people's questions and upvote them if you like. We will be sharing the recording and the slides. Closed captioning is available if you, if you should select that. And if you have any technical difficulties whatsoever, ever, feel free to put those in the chat or to email us at info at fsg.org and we'll make sure to get you taken care of. So why are we having today's conversation? Three main reasons why I thought this would be a phenomenal conversation for us to have together. The first is that I think there is an increasing recognition of the current scale and inequities that we have in our country around behavioral health that clash with um, the response from philanthropy around behavioral health. So I certainly don't need to make the case to anyone on this call about what challenges we face in terms of behavioral health. We know we're on the heels of the opioid epidemic. We know we're seeing life expectancy start to curb and off due to the so-called deaths of despair. We know that Behavioral health conditions are one of the top causes of morbidity and mortality for young people across the world. And those were all things that were in place and happening even before the pandemic, which certainly made us all more familiar with the effects of social isolation on our mental health. We know that today, um, about one in five adults has a behavioral health condition and 90% of Americans say they feel our country is in the middle of a mental health crisis. So it's a huge issue. And yet, according to the mo most recent data, only about 1% of philanthropic funding goes to behavioral health issues. Even if you look just within the funding that we put towards health as a country, only about 5% of philanthropic funding to health goes to behavioral health issues. So the first reason we're here today is because we know there is a gap between the scale of the need and the issues we face and philanthropy's response. The second major reason for today's conversation is that I see a huge desire among the clients I work with to go upstream and to really start working on prevention. I think there's a couple reasons driving this. One is that, that we're recognizing that we simply don't have the funding, even across all of philanthropy, to fund everyone who needs treatment. We certainly need to continue to work on access to, to highly culturally competent care. That is certainly a priority. But even if we had the funding to treat everyone who needed treatment, we don't have the workforce in our country. You'll see here a graph that shows that over almost half of Americans live in a space where there is a mental health care workforce shortage. So we don't even have the staff to, or the money to deliver the care we need. At the same time, I think this drive to move upstream to prevention is being driven by an explosion of really exciting science that helps us understand the root causes of behavioral health issues. For instance, early brain science and the, um, the fMRIs that are now more popular, they allow us to have research about how things like child trauma are affecting risk for later behavioral health conditions. We also have seen a plethora of research in the last five years around the social determinants of mental health. And I think this is inspiring all of us to think about how can philanthropic funding really be targeted towards changing those community conditions in a way that allows people to um, to live healthy lives and have healthy well-being. The third reason that I think today's conversation is really exciting is I think that there is a uniquely important role for philanthropy in addressing behavioral health. And I think many of you are recognizing that too. In particular, philanthropy's high-risk capital is really important in a space where we know we need a lot of innovation and change. Second, philanthropy is also in the position to be able to convene the different kinds of sectors that need to be involved in transforming our communities, whether that's juvenile justice, the child welfare system, the education system, the healthcare system. Philanthropy is uniquely able to, to in some cases, convene um, those different players together. 
So that's why we're talking about today's conversation is we know we want to see a more of a response from philanthropy in addressing this issue and more creative responses. So from there, um, a couple of things we hope you leave today with. The first is we hope that you'll leave today with a wider understanding of some of the strategies that can be used by philanthropy to advance behavioral health. Second, we hope you will be able to make more informed decisions about your investments based on some of the lessons learned from the other funders that you're gonna hear from today. And third, my greatest hope is that you leave today seeing new possibilities for yourself and for your organization to contribute to behavioral health equity. A couple definitions to ground our conversation. Today, I'm using the term behavioral health and using that to refer to substance use and mental health. There are um, legitimate concerns about the term behavioral health as it puts emphasis on the idea of a person's behavior. That said, the reason for using that term today is to make sure that when we have a discussion of mental health, we're not leaving substance use behind, um, which as we know, it's one of the most stigmatized parts of this, this challenge that we face. We like the definition of health equity put forward by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and find that in a, a version of behavioral health equity adapted from that is really helpful. Ultimately, the most important thing here is that achieving behavioral health equity would mean that a person's mental well-being would not be predicted by their race, social economic status, or any other aspect of their identity. So we want to hear a little bit from you all about how you have been addressing behavioral health in your communities. So you might recognize this tool. This is something my colleagues and I at FSG developed that shows how funders can be involved in supporting systems change. And I think it's a really helpful tool to think about the different strategies available to funders. In a moment, we'll be asking you to take a poll and tell us which of these you're currently using. I'll briefly describe them for you. Starting on the upper left, you'll see that supporting programs is probably the most traditional way that you see philanthropy supporting behavioral health equity. However, there are other things that philanthropy can do, like building the capacity of leaders in this sector. So that's things like asking, what if one grantee knew what, what if every one of our grantees knows what all of our grantees know? Doing things like learning communities across grantees or generating new knowledge is another strategy where funders can play a role in really helping people within communities understand what the challenges are um, and how things are and what the inequities are and how things are changing. On the upper right, you see uh, three strategies all really aimed at saying, how can foundations affect public or private sector investments? So the ability of foundations to influence other funders to get involved in behavioral health, to inform policy change, or to shape markets, meaning shaping the products and services that are, or the, or the prices of those products and services that are delivered. On the bottom, you see three strategies really aimed at addressing underlying conditions. That is the, the stories we tell ourselves, the power dynamics and the relationships. Um, that surround behavioral health. So the three strategies there that I would highlight are funders' role in catalyzing collaborative efforts at the community level, to mobilize community members, including people who have lived through mental health and substance use issues, um, to be engaged in the problem, and to shift public narratives around how we talk about behavioral health. You'll hear examples of these strategies from all three panelists that we, we talked to today. But first, we'd love to know which of these strategies you're using. So please fill out the following poll. You can select all the strategies that apply to you. And if you're currently not funding behavioral health, no problem, simply put um, not applicable, which is the last change, last option. Okay, we'll give folks just one more minute to fill this out. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing the results. So it seems like we have lots of folks who are, are working on building capacity. That's great. And catalyzing collaboration and then generating new knowledge, and maybe the least around mobilizing communities, influencing policy, and shaping markets are at the bottom. Great. Thanks so much for sharing that. It's great to see that there's a number of you using a lot of these different strategies. So with that, I'd love to bring up the panelists to discuss their experience with th these different strategies. 
Um, so first we have Beth Gantz, who is the executive director of the Cats Amsterdam Foundation. Cats Amsterdam is a family foundation that's relatively new, about five years old and based in Colorado. Um, and she will be sharing some of her insights about the foundation's efforts to really use capacity building and to generate new knowledge or data to support communities in advancing behavioral health. Marcel, Marcel Scaife is here. He's a strategist from the Missouri Foundation for Health. Um, as you know, the Missouri Foundation for Health is one of the largest uh, health conversion foundations in the country based in St. Louis. They work on a number of health topics. Behavioral health has been one of their areas. And Marcel in particular has um, helped lead the work that the foundation has done about <clears throat> narrative change around gun violence or gun firearm suicide, excuse me, um, in the state. Last, we have Ricky Barra, who's a senior program officer with the Hogg Foundation. That uh, the Hogg Foundation was initially a family foundation, now based at the University of Texas at Austin, um, that serves that works statewide. It's one of the oldest foundations in the country working on mental health. And Rick will be here to talk about um, their foundation's transition from really focusing on access to treatment to prevention, and particularly the role of community collaboration within that. So I'm delighted to have these three panelists here. They, as you can see, they represent a diversity in terms of the type of foundation and the geography and the size and age. But what they all share in common is that they have all done something unique in terms of their approaches that goes beyond funding just programs or even funding treatment. They've done something to say, how can we change the system or how can we work more upstream on prevention or both? Um, so with that, I'm delighted to welcome Marcel, Rick, and Beth to the conversation. And I would love to start with a question. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, there are a lot of philanthropic dollars not going to behavioral health um, and many organizations that have not prioritized behavioral health. So I would love to hear from you all about why your organization or you personally have um, are working in behavioral health. What is important to you about that? So I'll ask Rick to start. Yeah. Well, thank you, Abby. Um, so, well, the Hawk Foundation was established in 1940 um, with, you know, dedicated towards mental health. So we are based in Austin. We are a statewide grant maker. We fund throughout Texas. Um, and so, you know, mental health, resiliency and well-being has always been at the core of the Hawk Foundation since its inception. And you know, fast forward, we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like today. Um, on a personal note, um, I didn't really know what mental health was. It's not something that we talked about in my family um, growing up. But I remember times in my childhood when my uncle, you know, Frank would come and my mom would basically say, hey, Uncle Frank's not feeling well. Theo Pancho's not feeling well. So he's going to stay with us for a few days. Um, and, you know, and we said, OK, that, you know, I mean, that's that was kind of normal thing. Um, he was disheveled, didn't make a lot of sense and stuff. Mom cleaned him up, you know, mm -hmm. fed him you know, got him back healthy, you know, got some new clothes, and then he would take off, you know, five, seven days or so. And that was just like throughout childhood. And I never knew anything about mental health until I got into college and then graduate school. It's like, oh, that's what they call it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just like living at home, you know, I was kind of growing up. So, um, so, you know, mental health is very personal to me in that respect. Um, and then just professionally, just having the honor of working with in the Hog Foundation, you know, with their mission and vision. Um, and so um, anyway, well, I'm excited to be able to share a little bit more about our journey and our story at Hog. Beth, would you like to go next and share a little bit about why CAPS chose behavioral health? Sure, I'd love to. Um, yeah, absolutely. First, thanks, Abby and FSG for the opportunity to uh, be part of this discussion. I'm really excited to learn from Rick and Marcel, who are really experienced in this space. Um, as Abby mentioned, the initial program of the Katz Amsterdam Foundation was mental behavioral health in the mountain resort communities in the Western United States. And it was found, the foundation was founded by Rob Katz, who was the former CEO of Vail Resorts, which is the big ski company, and his wife, Alana Amsterdam, who's an author and founder of alanaspantry.com. I had worked with Rob at Vail before coming, we, we launched the foundation about five years ago. And before that, I had worked with Rob at Vail Resorts in part overseeing community relations. So Rob and I knew these mountain resort towns really well. Um, and uh, um, we had heard as, you know, part of our work at the company um, about the significant challenges um, that 
folks were really lifting up in these towns um, around mental behavioral health and that they weren't feeling like the community needs were being met. And um, there were certainly, a, you know, stigma then was very real. Um, uh, COVID changed that a bit, but this is before then, and um, which exaggerated other challenges that exist in these communities, the rural nature, um, the sort of resort and party culture, uh, the transient workforce populations um, year over year, and the stigma existed, I think, not just for those who were needing support, but also for funders. Um, and several of the communities at about this time around 2016, 2017, right before we launched, were convening uh, mental the practitioners that touch mental behavioral health across the entire community and really coming together to kind of discuss the challenges and try to uh, work on strategies, right, um, that would uh, better the services across the entire community. And so these collaborative efforts were starting to form in these communities. And I think that um, coupled with Rob and Alana's belief that mental behavioral health is part of healthcare period, and it should not be the underfunded, unsupported sort of other in the healthcare space. Um, and that we need to eradicate stigma around mental behavioral health and make sure people can access the services they actually need. So I think mostly, you know, certainly bringing that belief, but um, really hearing the need uh, from communities that we knew well um, made us want to dive in. Uh, thanks, Beth. That's great and really helpful to sort of hear how Rob sort of saw the issue as an employer too, not just a philanthropist of saying this is really affecting our company and and it's also a place where in terms of funding other other organizations maybe aren't stepping up because of the stigma that's great marcel how about you do you want to share what's important to you about working on behavioral health and why missouri foundation for health has, has worked in that area sure uh, thank you abby this is an important question and data helps us paint a clear picture of the need for our investment uh, i understand these numbers well they underscore the critical importance of our commitment to behavioral health. For the first time in history, we observed a concerning trend. Uh, black youth suicide rates have surpassed those of white youth suicide. This is a stark indicator of the urgent need for a comprehensive behavioral health support. Consider these statistics. From Missouri alone, 22% of adults, which amounts to over 1 million people, have experienced some form of mental illness. Additionally, 429,000 individuals have grappled with alcohol and substance mis misuse. What's even more alarming is that 55% of Missourian, Missouri adults are not receiving the necessary mental health treatment. This glaring treatment gap places an immense burden on our communities and individuals. To put this in perspective, while Missouri ranks 12th in terms of need for mental health services, it lags behind 31st in terms of access to these crucial services among the 50 states. This disparity reveals a systemic issue that our foundation is dedicated to addressing. Investing in behavioral health is not just about addressing an isolated issue, but about promoting complete wellness for individuals and communities. This data underscores the imperative nature of our work as we strive to bridge the gap between needs and access and ensure that everyone, regardless of their background, can receive the behavioral health support that they deserve. Thanks, Marcel, for highlighting both the scale of the mental health and the substance use. And I think what also comes through and what, you, what I'm reminded of as you say that is the extent to which for you, you came to this issue of behavioral health really from a justice lens and thinking about some of the inequities that really exist in this space as well. Correct. Thanks so much, yeah. All right, so as I mentioned, all of your foundations have in some ways funded treatment programs, yet each of you has also gone beyond funding treatment programs in your approach. Um, I mentioned some of those in terms of some of the things that you have done about um, Marcel, narrative change, Rick on collaboration, Beth on some of the network building and, and shared measurement. But I'd love to hear the story from each of you about why did you decide be to go beyond funding treatment programs and why did you select the strategies that you did as a foundation? So I'd love to Beth to start with this one. Beth, can you talk a little bit about how you got to the decision about how the foundation could help out in this unique way? around shared measurement and um, a network. 
Yes, of course. I It's probably clear from the introduction that Rob and Alana and I did not bring any professional experience at all to mental and behavioral health when we um, launched the foundation and started this program and focus area. We only brought our own personal experience to the table. Um, but as I also said, we did know these communities and knew that sort of while they are each unique, they share very similar challenges. And so in our first six months, we convened um, uh, behavioral health, mental behavioral health practitioners from each of the communities to come together to discuss issues, share challenges, brainstorm strategies. Um, and one thing that we heard loud and clear in this convening was that everybody was struggling with ideas of how to measure the impact of the work that they were launching and, and doing in their communities. Um, were they moving the needle? So with actually the help of FSG, we convened again, uh, after the convening, we convened again representatives from each community to create a shared measurement framework. And the um, communities decided together sort of what indicators were important to them to measure um, that would tell them that the mental behavioral health system and the programs that they were creating were serving the needs of those in the community. And these indicators are longer term measures. Um, and but they do help communities both look at the work that they're doing and the progress they're making within their community, but also can compare them to other communities in a shared learn, you know, for shared learning. Um, we've seen communities say, wow, you've moved the needle, you know, communities can ask each other or see the data from another community and say, wow, you've really moved the needle on this indicator. What programs are there? What are you doing? What's been successful? Um, or wow, we're really struggling in this space, but where can, you know, who can I look to that's um, had more success and what programs can I replicate? Um, and now the um, communities collect data every two years to feed into the framework. So we're starting to see, we're just probably this next year is gonna see trends over time. Um, and it's become a great shared learning tool for those communities. Um, and actually many of the communities use it to share out to other leaders within their community, um, but also uh, use it as a tool for fundraising purposes, which has been great for them to other funders. Yeah, thanks Beth, really appreciate that. So it seems, sounds like for the Katz Amsterdam Foundation, when you were thinking about your strategies, the gap was really saying, hey, we know people are sort of reinventing the wheel and dealing with the same challenges, and yet they're not able to learn from one another. And also for even that individual practitioner within a community to know, hey, I can tell if my program is helping or not, but are we making a difference at the community level? And how would we even know if we have the right programs in place in our community or not? And that was sort of a unique niche that the foundation could fill. Yeah, and can help the like these full collaborative entities that are existing across, looking at the system across the entire community, really understand where, oh, more work needs to get done, right? Because they're seeing kind of these indicators over time. Um, yeah, to give them the data. Yeah, great. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Marcel, Rick, maybe Marcel, you want to go next this time to talk about why did Missouri Foundation for Health go beyond just funding treatment programs? And what was the work you did, particularly around narrative change? What does that mean and look like? And how did you choose it? So well, one thing that we, we looked at as um, being a foundation, we can we can delve a little bit deeper into our work and our, and our willingness to self-reflect and access our practices when it comes to behavior health. We, we actively engage in like dialogue about equity and focus on how individual access to behavior health services are delivered to them. So our goal was to ensure that we remain responsive uh, to the evolving needs of communities and maintaining a strong presence in those communities. Uh, when we talk about system, well, not system change, but more or less narrative change in, in terms of our firearm suicide uh, work, uh, it was rooted in a multifaceted understanding about this complex social uh, dynamics at play. Uh, several crucial factors uh, went into this. So one, we looked at the evolving social landscape uh, around suicide, uh, and, and social societal attitudes and openness regarding mental health and suicide over time. Uh, the growing mental health conversations, uh, understand the complexity uh, of the work. Uh, the public is increasingly aware of suicide is not solely a mental health issue, uh, acknowledging the multifaceted problem that happens there. But one of the big things was the, the discussion on firearms. Uh, given the political change 
change charge nature of firearms in our in our community. Uh, it was interesting to start having these conversations. Uh, it was easy with the grantees to start talking about suicide. Suicide was you don't want to say an easy conversation, but you could have that conversation. Uh, once you introduce firearms, uh, the, the conversation uh, it got a little bit harder, or, or in some cases it stopped uh, because that was as far as community wanted to take it. And so we had to to take that pushback and how do we come back and redirect uh, what we're doing. And so one of the, the greatest things we, we could do is we gave communities opp opportunity to, to learn and to grow. Uh, we work with grantees to, you know, start with suicide, start having those conversations and start building those relationships. And then how do you get firearms as part of that conversation? And so it was really giving the grantees the space to have those conversations, to have those missteps, uh, and really to build those relationships. And so we knew we weren't going to change that narrative overnight, uh, but we let them keep keep going at it and keep going at it until they got comfortable within our own conversation. So we could create all of these talking points for grantees, you know, but you can take them in and you have to make them your own. And so we gave them the opportunity to make them their own and make the community their own and they really own their projects. And so they were able to start to have those conversations, start to shift that narrative. And with anything, we knew it was not going to happen. Right? And so that's why we have a long-term investment into the project to make sure that these conversations are continually happening and how do we help grantees and the communities build coalitions of stakeholders to keep having these conversations. So it's not only getting those grantees to have those conversations, but it was also helping them build a coalition of like-minded individuals to go into the community and continue to have those conversations, but really doing it at the speed that the community was ready to have those conversations. So it, was, it wasn't going at our speed, it was going at the community speed and us understanding that yeah, we're in St. Louis, and the and it's a lot of the grantees are in rural Missouri, and so giving them the opportunity to have a conversation that they need to have, and not putting our two cent in it, just letting them have the conversation, and we adjust it to how they were having those conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Marcel, and and that reminds me a little bit about what Beth was saying about how both of you chose to say, "Hey, let's step in in an area where." Um, even where it's a little bit controversial and where foundations can play a role in saying, hey, this is one of the tougher parts of suicide to talk about is the role of firearms. How can we help advance that conversation? Um, reminds me a little bit, Beth, of what you were saying about the way in which when you were thinking about the funding areas, you said, hey, behavioral health is something that people don't want to talk about. How can we play a role in really lifting that up? And Marcel, just a follow-up question for you. Um, narrative change can feel sort of philosophical. What does that mean? What does that actually look like? Can you help paint a picture of what that what that means? Some of your, you know, uh, the partnerships with frameworks and others. Can you just paint a picture of what it means to work on narrative change? For us, it was really just it wasn't. It was just a conversation. It was like, how do you really build relationships? I think with the firearm suicide initiative, it was really building those relationships. And building those relationships and then start to have those conversations. You know, we, we were starting to talk about safe storage and, you know, how does that resonate? We have grantees working with farmers and talking about farming, su farmer suicide and how does how does that, that resonate? So I think shifting that narrative was really opening up that conversation. You know, it's not saying that we came in and saying we're going to say we're going to shift the narrative and everybody has to practice safe firearms, you know, and, and it was let's just have the conversation and see where the conversation takes us. Uh, but we were able to build to, to bring in consultants to help us think about that uh, and help us think about how we approach that. And then, you know, in, in a sense, you know, we we had our, our framework and then we went to the grantees and was like, this may not work. And so how do we together come down and, and, and create some talking points? But again, going back to just building relationships, I think the shift in narrative, it, it goes back to building, you have to build those relationships and those are relationships that the foundation may not have had. And so trusting your community partners and trusting those grantees to, to build those relationships. And when they needed help building those relationships, we would you know, go back and we would, we would brainstorm, we would talk about it to help them go back to the table and, and create the relationships and making sure that the relationships and the people that you had around the table were the right people and who else was missing from that table. Uh, and so again, like we, we gave them planning grants, but then we're, we're in implementation now and they're still, they have the flexibility to, to build those tables and create more relationships. So, you know, it wasn't a, a one and done. We should be shifted in there to we move forward. This is just an ongoing process uh, to how we talk about firearms and suicide in the state. Yeah, great. Um, Rick, would love to bring you into this conversation. So Hog has done lots of different things over time to advance behavioral health, but how did you talk about sort of shifting from funding treatment to funding prevention and, and why did coalitions in particular 
stand out as a strategy for you all? Yeah, uh, you reminded me, we've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, we're like many foundations, many of our colleagues here on the call, uh, you know, we funded, you know, historically a lot of down, what I call downstream program services, evidence-based practices, workforce stuff, stuff that happens in four walls of clinics um, and in, you know, kind of uh, mental health settings. And, you know, um, but I can really kind of track some of the changes that we started to implement kind of dating back to 2009, actually before it was planning, but 2009, we hired two individuals with lived experience to, to work as program staff at the foundation, uh, which is kind of unheard of in the foundation world. Um, and then some of, and then our grant programs going forward, we really tried to flip the script in terms of really having them, you know, um, population led or community led, community driven. And for the, um, key stakeholders, if you will, to really kind of play more of a supporting role. Um, and so, you know, as we, as I think about our trajectory, I think there's three, to me, three core tenets that remain true today. That's inclusion, consumer voice, and community engagement. And so I think those are real kind of um, really pivotal, um, you know, kind of tenants for us uh, to help drive our work. Um, we had the luxury of um, in 2017, kind of going through our strategic planning process, Abby helped facilitate that and really helped to unlock a door that we weren't quite sure how to do that because we had always talked about wanting to move our work upstream. Didn't know what that meant exactly, uh, had some ideas, um, but Abby was really helpful in the FSG and using the wheel and some of the other tools to help us really think through what could be if we wanted to really go into this space that was an unknown area for us. Um, so we took that dive. Um, we trusted, you know, um, the process. And so um, we initially, our inaugural um, grant program was our collaborative approaches, well-being and rural communities, long name. It's on our website. And we decided to do rural um, because of just the history of, of being under-resourced, um, underserved, um, workforce shortage, health professional shortage areas, et cetera. Um, and so what we did is basically said, there's some frameworks out there, but we want to hear from communities in terms of what would make a difference. What are the challenges and what would be some proposed solutions and what would make a difference in the lives of, of you know, the people in your rural communities? So I didn't prescribe or we didn't prescribe a particular uh, framework for them to use. I mean, there's several collective impacts, one appreciative inquiry coalition, community action, coalition theory, um, et cetera. So, um, so, but basically we didn't want to be prescriptive. And for us, that was really kind of trying to turn power back over to communities. And for us to play more of a supporting role, technical assistance, sometimes that's cheerleader, sometimes that's marriage counselor slash mark mediator. Um, when you, you know, when they come, you know, um, hit some kind of bumps in the road in the process, but that's been, a real, you know, evolution for us. And, you know, I will say this, um, you can't do the outward grant making stuff like changes of your paradigm, you know, to do something like this without really doing some self-reflection and acknowledging like there's this power differential that we're accustomed to and that we have. And as much as we try to minimize it, it's always there, um, but you work on that. Um, and to trust communities, communities as the experts. We have expertise, but we are not the experts. That's kind of our saying at Hog. We have expertise, but we are not the experts. The people that live in these communities that deal with this day in, day out, they're the real experts. So who best to engage them on? What are the real, you know, social determinants? I use the term community conditions. Um, what are those community conditions that really contribute to, you know, poor health, poor mental health? Um, and what are the solutions that they, you know, they think would really make a difference and um, let's, you know, implement those, use our, our funding to do that and then evaluate and look to see if there's any needle moving. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that, you know, to do some, some of this real systems change that we're talking about, um, you have to be, it's a long game, you know, so we have our, our rural project, we have eight years of um, funding, um, you know, commitment on paper. And so you're talking about a seven to 10 year, you know, window to see any real appreciable, you know, kind of needle moving change in terms of, um, you know, systems change, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rick. 
what really stands out to me hearing all of you talk about, hey, you all did very different strategies in terms of how you found the foundation's niche in terms of where you were going to contribute. But all of you really spoke to one of the most important things about how you went about your strategy was really making sure to involve communities and grantees and to address some of the power dynamics for you all as a foundation. So that seemed like that was a key part of what all what each of you did. I'm curious if you'd like to share any more about what worked um, either about the way you went about community engagement or what else do you think really worked about your strategy for you and for your communities? What sort of put wind in your sails and made you say, yeah, this feels like this is the right area for us to be working. And anyone can start with this one. Can start. I mean, Marcel, you want to start? Great. Sure. One thing I, I do want to address when we start talking about power dynamics and power sharing is making sure that we go beyond uh, decision making. So when, we, when I think about power dynamics and power sharing is also creating a space and a place for community to show up and can be their authentic selves in that process. And they feel comfortable having those conversations with us. I think sometimes we get stuck and saying, you know, well, we're giving them the power, uh, but we also need to think about creating that space that they, they can show up and, and, and be their whole, their whole self. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of our firearm suicide prevention approach, one thing that kind of worked was was planning grants. And so we went into the approach of we gave out two year planning grants uh, because we knew that there was an absence uh, in an established framework to address a firearm suicide uh, in the state of Missouri. Uh, and so we recognized the need that we needed to cre create and somewhat create one. Uh, to achieve this, we engaged in, in the consultants and played a crucial role in guiding this, this process. Uh, and to the success, the, the planning grants were great because it gave the grantees the opportunity to stop reevaluate their work and really begin to dream. Uh, and I think for a lot of executive directors, when you tell them, I don't want any reports, I don't want any implementation. I just want you to stop and dream and think uh, and reimagine how you're doing your work. Uh, I think the biggest piece too was giving them the opportunity to go into a community and test some hypotheses and see if they work. And if they don't work, let's go back to the drawing board and see if they work again. And so they had two years to, to, to do that and two years to think about what kind of programs they wanted to implement into their community. And it, it fostered some creativity. It fostered some, some involvement uh, from the community. Um, and then they went to creating some implementation projects. And right now the grantees are in implementation, but they still have that ability to dream. And so there's nothing saying, you know, if this, if we tested this and it didn't work, you're stuck to do this. You know, how do you help them shift and how to think about shifting? And so like they have the, the 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 support to say, you know, this is not working for us. And that's, we may have to look at a different target population or we may have to look at a different county to work. in. And so always giving them that flexibility that, you know, as long as we're staying within that scope of work and we're not changing the project totally, how do we shift to make sure that it, the community is getting what it needs? So those planning grants were great because it just gave organizations who were new to firearm suicide. Uh, the foundation was new to firearm suicide. So as they were planning and learning, we were planning and learning right along with them. Uh, and for the most part, they knew that we were just we were in it with them. We we're learning every time they were on our webinar. We were trying to figure it out as well. So those planning grants for anybody, those were were just great because it gave those uh, organizations the opportunity to stop, think, and dream. Uh, but I think executive directors have to get in a position where they can stop thinking and dream because we still had to go back and say like, we don't want you implemented. We want you to just think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's kind of hard when you work with individuals who are they they use they're doing the work. And so to tell them to stop doing the work and, and think about it for a second, it was kind of hard. We, we got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So one of the ways you really tackled sort of getting people to be more innovative, innovative and think outside the box and foster that sense of community engagement within the work, mm -hmm. planning grants, super helpful for that part. What else, Rick, Beth, what would you add yeah. as things that have worked yeah. really well for the community to help with that community engagement part? That's such I, I'm a big advocate for planning grants. Uh, for multi-year grants, we usually do like a one-year planning grant. Um, for this eight-year commitment that we have in rural communities, it was like a three-year planning grant because it's just unrealistic that you say green light go project implementation on day one. I mean, it's like so... I think everybody should do planning. Like, I mean, we've done six month planning periods and I'm in planning. Typically for multi-years, we'll do a one year. Uh, but uh, I think there's tremendous value because then it takes the, the pressure and the burden off of the grant partners who's the, and like, it allows them, like what Marcel was saying, allows them to dream, give them time and give them space and say, you got a year to dream and think this thing through. And then we'll, let's have a conversation about kind of where you think you're at. And then where do we go from here? Um, so I, I love it. I'm a big advocate for planning grants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Anything else, Beth, that you'd looked up about things that have worked well in your strategy overall or that have supported some of the community engagement? I think one, and it comes with sort of its own tensions. You know, I mean, we, you know, I agree completely with Rick and Marcel in terms of the community driven and um, trust based grant making. And we, you know, the, these mountain resort towns are very small. And so the ability to truly convene virtually everyone working around mental behavioral health is, is real uh, because of the size of the communities. And so when we do our grants process each year, we ask the community to come, those, the, those working in mental behavioral health to come together to really discuss what the priorities are for the, for the community for that year. And we say like, we know that's hard. <laughs> we know it's hard to kind of, you know, say maybe it's not my program, maybe it's a different one, maybe it's this this year. Um, and we still think it's better than us saying what the priorities would be, you know, a foundation coming in and saying, here's what the priorities should be for the community for this year. And so trying to kind of hold um, both of those pieces, um, you know, and then I think the other, uh, thing that comes up there is we hold values of community driven and wanting to do our work with an equity lens and um, and supporting and the community driven piece supports the collaboration sort of within the community. And we're navigating kind of how to realize both of those at the same time um, and that recognizing that, you know, sometimes that it's a process um and we're we're figuring we're figuring it out as we go it's not perfect to start yeah yeah thanks beth for sharing that we have some really good questions coming in from the audience for all of you so i love this one um a couple really juicy ones um one question is since these systems change strategies like narrative change or policy and and advocacy may take many years to realize an outcome how do you work with grantees and authentically monitor progress and think about success along the way? So basically, how are you how are you all dealing with the fact that the strategies that you selected are all pretty long term? And I, I actually I will add to that that there was another question here that people asked: How do you make the case for these kinds of system systems change approach, approaches that you've taken versus a more direct service or programmatic approach? including with your board and other stakeholders. So I think it can be a challenge. And I think all of you have wrestled with this in some ways to say, you know, we can be under some pressures as a funder to achieve results, to be able to show the concrete numbers and progress. How do you, how have you, what have you learned about reconciling the long-term nature of systems change strategies with the short-term desire for results and outcome? Well, at, at the Missouri Foundation for Health, we went from from being a grant maker to to really looking being a catalyst for change. So we we take a system to change approach to everything that we're we're doing right now. And um, I think how we overcome that is we um, we invest for the long term. You know, so we don't we don't go into anything saying this is going to be a one and done. This is you know a two year project and we're going to walk away from it because it it didn't take two years for these systems to get in place. And so we're not going to be able to solve this problem in, 20, in two years. I, I, for inst instance, our food justice uh, work is a 20 year investment. And it's the first time we invested 20 years into a certain project because we, it's going to take us that long to try to, to, it may take us 20 years just to figure out well, how we're going to get started. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we, we make sure that we make the, the, the case with the board for the investment into the project. Uh, mm -hmm. And we put the resources behind it. I think that the, the greater, the, the best part about system change and the work that we're doing now is that the flexibility into changing things. So like with those planning grants, I had grantees come to me like, well, this is not working. I'm like, okay, change it. And so to have that simple response back to them, like change it, you know, because we have the time to change it. We, I, I don't think we want to move fast. We want to get it right. And so with system change is really, how do you get it right? And how do you make sure that you're centering the community as you do the work? And so for us, you know, it's making that, making sure we make that, that, that investment into the community's future and so that it may take time to, to get there and we have a supportive president and ceo and a supportive board and a supportive uh leaders who who, who understand that investment that we have to make to make meaningful change in the state i i agree i would just echo the like the emphasis on learning and continued learning um you know for us the idea behind the shared measurement framework um, was a resource for the communities to learn from each other and um, and within their own community. 
And actually, when we first launched it in the first year, every like the grantees would call me and be like, okay, so the CAF framework, CAF, meaning CATS Amsterdam Foundation framework, I'm like, it's not the CAF framework, it's your framework. Um, and it's not a tool that we're using to evaluate anything or it's it's meant for share, for learning. And having to sort of instill, um, you know, and keeping the power, knowing the power dynamic that exists between obviously grantee and funder and, you know, making sure to instill sort of like this is truly a learning tool and we'll learn things that work and we'll learn things that don't work um, in using a tool. And it, it um, eventually sort of forced us to, or didn't force us, created the idea, I should say, um, that my coworker Heather and Abby drove last year to create a visualization of this framework, a data dashboard, we call it and an easy way for communities to kind of see and visualize this data, but also to see it, their community in comparison to other communities. And it was a huge, it's been a huge unlock. One, I think when you can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it like it is their data and they can share it with other leaders in the community. So nonprofits can go to a county, you know, board of um, directors and share sort of, you know, things that are happening in the community or, or what people are experiencing around the mental behavioral health system in the community. Um, as I mentioned before, they use it to point, you know, to for other grant requests and, you know, working with other funders, right, to show the need. And, um, and it's that also has been this, you know, our own learning of like, the framework wasn't, um, was part of the solution. And then being able to sort of visualize how to really use that data to truly understand that we want to learn from it. Um, versus evaluate only from it. Thanks, Beth. Um, Rick, how about you? Anything you'd add here about how, what advice would you have for other funders that are thinking about systems change strategies and saying, yeah. hey, I feel that pressure about these are going to be, these are going to take a long time. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I will say this. Um, when I was in graduate school a long, long time ago, we were talking about workforce shortages. 20 years ago in the field, talking about workforce shortages. 10 years ago, Still in the field, talking about workforce shortages. Abby just showed a slide today, 2023. What are we talking about? Workforce shortages. And we know because, you know, kind of mental health is in our DNA, is that not everyone who has a mental health condition needs a licensed psychologist, a board certified psychiatrist, a clinical social worker. So, you know, or go to a treatment setting. A majority of people need resources, support, and a place they can go to. Um, and so for us, you know, it just made sense that, you know, instead of keep funding our integrated care, which is something we're known for, we funded it well over a decade, kind of nationally known for that work, um, to say, you know what, there's got to be another way. And we really believe that mental health is in on this continuum. And so a lot of people do the downstream, you know, stuff, and that's okay. Um, but we wanted to kind of challenge ourselves and say, let's go upstream. Let's see how we could support communities and, and learn from communities about how, you know, kind of taking this kind of holistic, you know, population health approach. Um, again, we believe that mental health is essential to overall health. You can't have good physical health without good mental health and vice versa. So how we support it, how we think about supporting communities, that was a really driving force for us to kind of move our work upstream and to trust communities and to learn from them. And we've learned a lot over the, you know, we, you know, this, particularly the rural project, you know, it's been in its, um, five years, we've completed five years and we've learned a, an awful lot about what works and what doesn't. And then, then the last thing I'll say is that it's hard, you know, you can't really compare rural versus rural because they're so different. You know, their assets are different. The relationships are different. The history is different. The challenges may be different, some common threads, but there's going to be some differences. So, you know, I, that's one thing that I would, ask for people to think about and reflect on is that, you know, you can't kind of, you know, uh, think of urban as the same as another urban or rural or border communities, um, um, because there are going to be some some differences. And so part of that is that just doing those listening sessions that we've all done, you know, learning, listening, observing, asking questions um, to help inform us how we as we move our work forward. Great. Thank you all for that. Um, a couple questions are coming in about your individual approaches. So I'll let Marcel start with this one. Um, the question is, 
how do you change narratives without perpetuating racial biases? Any thoughts on that one? You really have to have open and honest dialogue about equity. I think from the foundation standpoint, we center equity at all. And so we go into it with a racial equity lens. We go into it talking about equity, not only looking at race equity, but looking at, you know, all the other terms, uh, things that involve for equity and making sure that everyone is represented at the table. Um, and I, again, it always goes back to, for me, to relationship building. How do you build those relationships? How do you show up in your authentic selves? How do you, you, you support community and, and, and not going to community giving a prescriptive, this is what you need, this is what we're gonna give you, but understanding what the, the issues of those communities, the systems that kept the communities in the places that there are, mm -hmm. and how do you understand that community and learn from the community, and then build some community champions to go out and do the work. I don't necessarily think we need to come in and do the work. We work with stakeholders and build champions when those stakeholders, because they know their communities and they do the work and they can address those racial equities and those other equity issues as they do that work. Uh, but again, I'm always going into it with a, with a lens of thinking about equity and thinking about the underserved communities and how do we, I push not tokenize those communities, but 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 get, get the value out of those communities and make sure that we're respectful as we do do that work. Uh, it's, it's a hard line to walk, but I mean, always centering community at, at, at your center and equity at your center issue, it, it will get easier all the time. Yeah, thanks Marcel. Um, Beth, Rick, anything that you would want to add about how you all put equity at the center, some of the things that helped you or specific things you did um, that have been helpful for, for equity, picking up on what Marcel was saying? Perhaps, Beth, you could talk about some of the disaggregation of data and, and how that played a role in helping equity conversations. Um, yes, and I, you know, I think we, as I talked about, um, it's uh, a value we hold and one that we try to navigate in terms of also having supporting collaboration amongst community and asking community right to be as inclusive um, and equitably minded as as they can be. Um, and but the the back to the data, I feel like it's all about the data, but the data piece. Um, you know, it was really eye opening for people when they started to collect community community survey data and provider data and other information and we and we disaggregated it so looked at it sort of across gender breakdowns racial breakdowns other um uh lgbtq a plus breakdowns and um you know really helping folks see hear and see um and understand the unique experiences of different communities and uh what those needs were um and you know versus just thinking of like an entire you know county as uh, one population and i think that that was that really spurred a lot of great conversation across communities about um how uh folks were you know one listening to community voices and then building programs right based on sort of what they were hearing in in those parts of their community mm -hmm. fabulous thanks beth um, and I remember some of the data when we first got to look at the disaggregated data for the first time and how fun that was for the communities to be able to say, oh, you know, you've kind of known things like loneliness are an issue in our communities, but now we can actually see that it's things like within the Latino community, it's actually highest and it's highest among women within that community. And that just enabled different kinds of conversations about what can we be doing um, to target some of the uh, to target our work towards some of the folks who are most marginalized within our community. So remember that. And what voices do we need to bring forward, right, to help sort of truly understand, you know, better understand what that data is showing and so that we can better serve those needs, right? So making sure that the right voices are at the table. Yeah, indeed. Thanks. I'd love to move us on to the last question to make sure we have time for it. Um, I'd love for each of you to share what is one thing that you think we can do as a field of philanthropy to, um, to support the field of philanthropy in making greater investments in behavioral health and more creative investments in behavioral health equity going forward. What is your wish or advice for how we can get, we know philanthropy is underfunding behavioral health and maybe doing less systems change strategies than we'd like to see. How can, how can we move beyond that? I think one thing we could do that um, 
you know, as those that are in it, right, is really lift up the voices of those that are doing incredible work and use our microphones, if you will, to share the work that they're doing. Because I think often when you hear about the work, you can have a better vision of understanding what you can support. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, under, really knowing what's happening, right? And so that we can, uh, it gets more enthusiasm going, but also just like, you know, it's easier to envision how to engage when you hear about it. Yeah. So really be a microphone, lift up what grantees are doing to other funders as well. Okay, great. Yeah. What else? What, what can I had this long list, but after having these conversations, I should have wore a shirt that just says dream. I think we ask grantees to dream and we should dream too. And because if we stick to the status quo, we're going to put out the same RFAs and RFPs that get the mm -hmm. same answers and responses that we know the answers and responses to. Uh, I think dream and, and, and we'll be willing to get uncomfortable. Uh, I think sometimes we get comfortable funding big health organizations, but, but what look, what's, community's not receiving health services like that. And so how do we get uncomfortable and really just take that risk? Take the risk uh, and think about who and how you're funding things. Uh, right now, we're looking at how we who and how we're funded because we know that the typical community is not showing up to the huge behavioral health centers. They're showing up to small community organizations. And how do we take that risk and uplift those organizations because they're doing the work for the community? Mm, great. Yeah. Rick, how about you? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more about amplifying the voice of communities um, in terms of the work. They're the ones who do the hard work. I mean, I say that all the time. Like people say, oh, Hog, you do great work. It's like, no, the people that we invest, that we support, they're the ones who do the great work. And so I will make sure I pass those accolades on to them because it is hard work. Um, and um, so, again, I think, you know, how we can amplify their voice. And also, you know, I think, you know, money is important and foundations have money. But we have a lot more than that. And I kind of remind a lot of my foundation colleagues that, you know, we have internal assets and resources that we can bring to bear to support, you know, these community led actions. Um, you know, I have a comms team and they've developed cool toolkits for, you know, our role in terms of social media, how to message, how to create flyers, you know, kind of messaging stuff. Um, you know, our policy folks, they'll go into our communities to do policy advocacy 101 um, because people are really, there's an appetite for like, how do we use our voice to really mobilize movements to improve things in our communities? And so you do that through advocacy, right? And through, you know, kind of looking at, you know, kind of policy related issues. And so they'll go out into the field and do, you know, kind of policy 101 advocacy um, to kind of help them understand, you know, how they can use their voice and how to do community action, community mobilization. Um, our archives, we have an archives person who can help them preserve the history. You know, there's like, this is a long, significant investment, and we're hoping that this will be a catalyst for them to continue to this movement beyond, you know, the funding. So how do you preserve that history and, and what are ways you can do that um, to be able to kind of bring that to life in, in a website, but also... How do you preserve that history? Um, so I always think about how we try to leverage our internal resources to support the work of communities. Yeah, wonderful. I think those are three really great messages to end on. So we need to collectively lean into the to the ability of philanthropy to really lift up the work of grantees and communities, to really take those risks and ask others to dream big and dream big ourselves, as well as thinking about all the kinds of support beyond the financial support that philanthropy can offer in this field. Well, they're wonderful closing remarks. Um, with that, I'll just, a couple next steps. We'd love to hear from you all about what is one thing you're taking away from today's conversation, either about philanthropy's possibilities or roles in behavioral health equity. And then we also, if you'd like to keep the conversation going, I wanted to lift up two events that are coming up this month about systems change. We have um, our, my, our, my colleagues at the Collective Impact Forum are hosting a session called Supporting the Conditions to Advance System Change on November 8th and exploring the relational core of system change work, something that came up today about how important relationships are. If you'd like to go deeper on that, the link will be in the chat. Um, and thank you so much. I'm seeing the comments come in on many of the things that were helpful today. I also just wanna do a huge thanks to Beth, to Marcel and to Rick. Um, I know this is a, I know you all came to this conversation saying, I don't have all the answers. And I love the way you shared your lessons that you've learned along the way and your willingness to do that. 
and your collective experience of, of together decades of trying systems change strategies is, um, is really so valuable. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you to the panelists and um, wish you all the best. Thanks. Thanks.